Commissioner's work session for May 22nd, 2024 at 9 a.m. First, we have the Lake Level Control Structure Special Assessment District Funding Request by our controller, Jody Valentino. So just to clarify, this doesn't have anything to do with the um, assessments as far as what the delegated authority working on. This is simply from the point of view of we have three special funds that are established for expenditures. Um, and year to date for 2024, um, I have no money because we spent all the money that was allocated last year by the Board of Commissioners, but uh, we do have expenses. So I do need the board to approve um, the transfer of funds um, from the tax payment fund to the Higgins Lake, Houghton Lake, and Lake St. Helen special assessment districts. Year to date, um, beginning on January 1 for Higgins Lake, we have spent thirty thousand five eighty five eighty seven for Houghton Lake. We have spent one hundred fifty nine thousand two ninety eight fifty five, and for Lake St Helen, we have spent thirty nine thousand eight hundred three seventeen. In talking to the delegated authority and looking forward um, on where he estimates um, his time and additional billings may come from. He's looking at probably an additional like 22, 22,000 on Higgins Lake. Um, he is looking at for Houghton Lake, probably a rough estimate of another 30,000 for both his time in the engineering. And then on Lake St. Helen, probably an additional 20,000 for uh, moving forward with with those. So we'd be looking at roughly uh, total allocation for Higgins Lake for this year of 54,000 is my request. Houghton Lake would be a total allocation of 190,000. And then for Lake St. Helen, a request for a total allocation of 70,000, which would bring us up to 230,000 total to be transferred in from the tax payment fund. Have some questions? Okay. Excellent. Um, you said that this, we're going to transfer the money from the tax fund to the special assessment districts. Is that, is that, is that what you're saying? That would be to cover the bills that have already been expended. Right. That's simply because these funds are in a negative, and so the money needs, money needs to come from someplace right. in order to pay the bills until such time that the uh, assessment notices are collected upon once those processes come. And then all of this is reimbursed to the county through that process. I know at one time you suggested we had a lot of talks about the actual tax fund paying for this development of the special assessment districts. Is, uh, is that still on the table or is that now off the table depending on what's going on or uh, because- it, That is a board decision. Yeah, that's a board decision. Okay, so so that that's still out, out there and uh, we can make that decision later on. In other words, the public was very, very upset about all three lakes with the special assessment districts and where that money was coming from to pay for that. And we had thrown it out there that, well, we as a board can pay for the development of the special assessment districts, not the projects, but the development of the special assessment districts that could be paid for out of the tax fund. So I just want to get that out there that to the public that that is still uh, a possibility of, of happening. Is there still enough money in the tax fund to pay? So that would be a conversation that you guys would want to have with Rebecca, with our treasurer Reagan, um, when it comes to where the actual funding sits um, as far as the needs for collections have been. I know she came and she gave her quarterly report and expressed some concerns about um, <coughs> continuous continuous use and not repaying um, because in, in her progresses, I think she's looking at having these repaid back through those collections. Um, but that That's what I understand that we were going to have the, yeah. the special assessment districts were not going to have to repay that. That was going to be. That, that's a board decision. I can't, well, yeah, I mean, that's not my decision. That. You're going back to that again, but I'm just, what I'm saying is, so is, is, is it still going to be a repayment scheme or is it going to be a payment scheme? That's, That's something decision. that has yeah. to be talked about by the board. Jody yeah. doesn't make that decision. Okay. I that is a right board. To transfer money from the tax payment fund well, I, I, to I, the three special funds so that they are out of the hole and you can continue to fund these projects. Well, I know at one time yeah. there, Rebecca had said that there was no problem doing that, that we have plenty of money there to do it. Is it, is it the case now that there's... She's not here she's not and... Here and I, yeah, I don't want to speak on behalf of Treasurer Reagan. Okay. okay. Um, well, I just want, I want to throw that out there. Okay, just so everybody knows that that's 
still a possibility being on the table because yeah, we have a way it, it um, builds a lot of mistrust with the public when we say, hey, yeah, we can do something and then nothing happens with it. She certainly had higher repayment rates than I think uh, we've had in several years now as far as having to reimburse those counties mm -hmm. um, than anticipated, but where her final final dollar amount figure is in her head for what she would have to repay again this year to make all the townships whole for 2025. I don't know the answer, only she will. So. I, I wanted to get, oh, there, here she is right now. There she is. Yeah, but we're not going to. Thank you, because I'm not speaking of you. <laughs> we're not going to call her on the spot right now. That's, it'll be something that she can present to us when it comes time. But I'm not going to call her on the spot right at the moment. That's not what we're discussing with. Well, of course it is. That's what, of course. It's no, it's no, it's not. It's what we're discussing funds is transferring of funds. What you're talking about is a whole separate subject that we will have our treasurer report at at some point. But right now, what's on the table is to transfer money so Jody can pay bills. That's what's on the okay. table. Okay. Yes. We don't need to worry. The word scheme sounds, it connotes the fact that we're doing something that's not transparent. I know that's how you talk and, and I, I appreciate that. <laughs> but I just want to let people realize that when you say scheme, it sounds like a lack of transparency. That's not what we're, we're trying to do here. Sorry for my voice today, but I'm going to drink more coffee. So Jody, do we just need a motion next week? Do we just t t in, now or? In two weeks, we would need a motion to do that. Yes. Okay. Yep. And I did copy Treasurer Reagan in the original um, information that I had sent you guys on May 10th so that she was aware. So. And, and I just want to say, I'm not opposed to this. I just want to make sure that it's still out there that there is a possibility of a repayment method <laughs> of, uh, uh, that we can make as commissioners to getting the establishment of all three special assessment districts up there to be paid for out of the tax fund, as opposed to uh, having the people in the special assessment district pay for it. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion on that? Okay. <laughs> okay. Number two, ask my tax proposal discussion of the whole. I know that this proposal has been gaining um, headway downstate. That being said, I don't know if all of you guys have kind of read the article and brought yourself up to speed on it. Um, I know that I don't believe that everybody would understand exactly what it would mean if it did get on the ballot and pass. State of Michigan is going to find, in my opinion, ways to collect money one way or the other. And in the end, I think that if it were to get on the ballot and pass, that people are going to be worse off. The theory may sound wonderful, but in the end, I think people are going to end up paying a lot more. Yes. I think it's going to hurt the small counties. Even paying more um, Do we know the deadline for filing for this to be on the ballot? Yeah. I do not. Any guess? <laughs> August 14th. The, late, the state legislature has, um, yeah, so they have the petition deadline or filing. Petitions are actually deadlined as earlier than August 14th. The ballot wording itself deadline is August 14th. So the ballot wording hasn't been formed yet either at this point that we know of. Um, I'm not aware. It, the Board of Canvassers very well may have the wording. Um, they would have had to present a lot of information to get this, um, to get it approved. So, yes. My personal opinion is uh, any scheme like this <laughs> is going to have a very difficult time in passing. And we're not doing the scheme, it's the state that's doing the scheme. <laughs> So I think it's going to have a very about as much chance of passing as a millage increase does. I, I agree with Eric. Uh, I've heard that it doesn't have the legs to continue, but obviously we'll find out really soon. But I agree with you. 
Anybody else? I didn't think the state of Michigan was bringing this on. I thought it was another coalition. Is those uh, Democrats in uh, Lansing? <laughs> Discussion on it. Well, the problem is, you know, you as a taxpayer, if something comes along and says, hey, we got a plan, you don't have to pay no more property taxes, how are you going to vote? Most taxpayers might look at this like, yeah, I'm voting for that without yeah, looking at the repercussions of it. Hopefully the taxpayers are more intelligent than that. I give them more, more credit than you do, I guess, Rex. I don't like paying property taxes any more than anybody else does. But I, I, do know, I do know if you're going to do away with property taxes, you have to replace that with something adequate. Mm -hmm. I think it costs more money. Our RCSO cadet position, Sheriff Stern. Sheriff, I gave you a copy of what I passed out to the board. You're welcome. Good morning. Good morning. If some of you overheard our conversation that Herb and I were having earlier, recruitment and retention of employees, we are suffering with recruitment alone. Retention we're doing pretty good with, but we lost one uh, deputy a couple weeks ago who went to the Michigan State Police because he can make more money there. Departments nationwide are competing with each other to try to bring in employees and then keep employees. And one way that we've come up with to try to work on our recruitment is starting a cadet program. And basically what that what that looks like is it's a paid internship. Um, bring people on, start them off doing different jobs, learning about law enforcement, and then with the hopes of then continuing on and putting them into the police academy. Right now we're five positions short and have been for well over a year. Um, seems like we hire somebody and then we lose somebody due to retirement, or in this case, we lost one to another agency. Um, a couple people have just gotten out of law enforcement. So it's been a revolving door for us on the road patrol side. The jail side, we've been surprisingly been staying pretty, pretty good there. Um, but when you're competing with different departments, as everybody's hiring, there's a lot that goes into it. And a lot of departments pay more money than our agency does. A lot of the surrounding agencies pay anywhere from two to three to four dollars more an hour than we do. What we do offer, which young people don't understand, is a better medical and a better retirement package than those other agencies. But young people don't look at that right now because they're not using it and they're not even close to thinking about retirement. They're looking at how much am I making now? So our thought is, is that if we can start recruiting some cadets keep them in the department, get them accustomed to our agency, we've got a better likelihood of then having qualified applicants to send to the police academy. And that's the thought process on this. Right now we have two cadet or two potential cadets that if they pass their reading and writing and their physical fitness test on May 30th, we want to bring them on as cadets for the summer, have them work Marine Patrol, ORV Patrol, shadow on the road, shadow in the jail, learn all these different positions that we have and then in the hopes of then sending them to the police academy in august my concern is that if we don't do something like this i can tell them yeah we're going to send you to the police academy in august but if they start shopping around for other agencies by that time that the police academy comes up they may be employed by somebody else it's a way for us to keep them in-house is our thought process 
Griff, I think this is a great idea. What what are the golden handcuffs to stop them from going through the training, being a cadet, and then shipping out to another agency? There isn't. We hope that we can convince them to stay with us. Just, I mean, there's we have to have some kind of incentive to have them do that. If we if we go through the expense of training them as a cadet, because that does cost us money. That, that, that's why I'm wondering, some kind of golden handcuffs, in other well, words, to promise them additional pay or, or the thought bonuses is, or... If the thought the process is, is that starting them as a cadet and then sending them to the police academy or the corrections academy, then they become a full-time employee. Right. With our pay scale and our benefits and, and everything that goes along with that. Um, is there a way, for, for example, we say... Hey, you stay with us a year, you get two grand. You stay with us for five years, you get five grand. Is there any type of uh, so? Because that's a little bit of golden handcuffs to have right. to stay. I, and, I, and I know what you're saying. The way we have it set up with the pay scale is starting at fourteen fifty, fifteen an hour, which is probably more than some younger people are making in jobs outside of in the, in the civilian world, up to sixteen twenty four an hour, which is what our starting correction officer makes. The problem that we would have if we start offering bonuses for staying is that's not fair to the people that have been here and have stayed here mm -hmm. because they're going to wonder where they're, you know, I've, I've dedicated myself to this agency and now you're bringing new people on and giving them bonuses mm -hmm. and I'm not getting a bonus. But, but you're going to have the same problem. They're going to, potential is still going to be there. We do oh. all the training and they're going to leave, not just because they oh. might like it here. I, I agree. You know what I'm saying. I mean, there's got to. We have to have some kind of a methodology. If, if it's a new program, our our hope is that by bringing them in early, we can show them that we are a professional department, and that we do things the right way. And our environment and our culture is a culture that they want to stay in, but where they may not be making as much money, the environment that they're working in is probably more conducive than some of the other agencies where you're just a number compared to an actual employee or family member. Yes. I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, you, you can make almost as much as McDonald's. I mean, yes. And you, 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 just because we can't. Commissioner Melbourne. Tell me. The military is just like, it's just like the military. It's a family. So you, you create that family environment. I appreciate what you're doing. You got my support. Thank you. You got my support. Thank you. Thank you. The money's already budgeted there. I mean, like I said, we have five positions that have been budgeted for at the beginning of the year. So the hopes is I, I don't I don't foresee being able to find five. Like I said, right now we have two. Um, and you're grateful for that. And I am very grateful for that. Um, Madam Chair? Yes. Um, if I'm reading this correctly, there is kind of an incentive there, correct? They have to repay if they, if they leave. leave. So uh, that, that's where I was going to next. Right now, there is a grant through the Michigan Commission on Law Enforcement Standards that will pay a department up to $24,000 to send someone through the police academy. So it doesn't cost us any money to send them to the police academy. That pays for the tuition and the wages while they go through the police academy. If they leave and they were funded under that grant, there's no repercussions. We can't go back after them for money that the state gave us to send them to the academy because it's no out-of-pocket expense. What we can hold them to is that if there's extra that comes out of the department's budget to train them, to send them to the police academy, then yes, we can go after that those expenses based on a four year contract or with, if they leave within the first year, they got to pay back hundred percent, 75 the next year, 50 the third year and 25 if they leave the fourth year. And Jerry, yeah, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I'm, I'm in, I support this. No, I understand. Okay. I, I'm just trying to figure out a way so we don't end up being in the same position we are right now with having people leave after we've spent the money and time and effort and training and everything and getting them on board. Yes. Madam Chair and Sheriff, is this time sensitive? I would like to start this, like I said, the 30th, January 1st or June 1st. They test on the 30th. Do you need an hour or do you need two weeks from now? 
I, I guess I don't even know if we need a resolution for it or not. I'm going to look at the controller for that because it's already budgeted positions. Yes and no, um, because you're adding a different type of position, they would need to approve the cadet position, which is a non-union position that's gone through the process um, already. The actual program itself under the grant to pay for somebody to go for, you don't need our approval. Um, okay. Yeah. Question I, the question I have, Madam Chair, is should we move on this as quickly as possible, possibly today? Is it possible time sensitivity or can we wait two weeks? Not necessarily for a question, but it's probably something that should be posed today. Yes. Uh, I would like to move on this before we put people in place and then mm -hmm. vote on it. Okay. I, I, if possible. Mr. Russo, I agree. <laughs> then during the break. I think it's your choice. To I think, I think we need to do this in this meeting, the coming meeting, in, in an hour. If we can get together a motion that we need by before our next meeting and stuff like that, I'm fine with that to add it to it. Thank you, Madam Chair. we can get it done. Before this, at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In between. I, 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 I we, we, we need to make sure we move on it so the chair mm -hmm. can do his job. Thank you. Yeah, I don't Absolutely. want you to hire people and then we vote on it after. Right. So I, I, I get it. Yeah, I would have yeah. held off if we had to wait, wait longer. <sighs> All right. The next thing. Because uh, there's actually three. There's only two listed, but there's there's three. The sec the second part is I'll I'll stay in line here is a incentive program for our current employees. <clears throat> and it deals with recruitment. Again, still the same, the same issue that we're having, trying to find people. So we've proposed and we've sat down with the union and they've agreed with it as well, is that if any employee of our agency recommends or recruits someone to apply and they get hired with our agency, they get a $500 bonus. If that person successfully completes either the corrections training program or the field training program for the roadside, that employee who recruited that person would get another $5,000. So a total- 5,000? Uh, 500, I'm sorry. Okay. So they have, a, they, have a, they have a chance of making up to $1,000 or bringing people into our agency. Again, trying to recruit is very, is, is hard, it's difficult. The thing about this is I can have, any, anybody can apply, this, but if they get hired or not, they would, they, would get the, they would get the incentive. And Mark can probably attest to this and Dave, because they've been in, the, in this realm. If you bring somebody on, you have a vest, vested interest in that person. You want that person to succeed. So our thought process and our vision is that, okay, if I, if I me as a, as a regular road officer, I recruit somebody and they get hired with our agency. I'm going to take a vested interest in that person and I'm going to mentor them to, to succeed, correct? Instead of just bringing them on and then walking away from them, I want them to succeed. That takes extra time, extra patience, uh, putting more work into that, that person to help them succeed. So there's some financial reward for that. That makes sense, Joe. Did I explain that properly? Mm -hmm. Okay. I like it. And then the third part that I have: our field training officers on the roadside and our corrections uh, training officers have the responsibility to train these new people that we hire. It takes a lot of time, a lot of stress, a lot of extra responsibilities. And it's a lot of extra liability. They go to specialized training to be training officers. And they're not being compensated for it other than the regular rate of pay that everybody else is receiving. So what we're suggesting is that if they are actively training a new employee, they receive a dollar an hour for that time frame that they're conducting the field training. So for example, if I had somebody assigned to me and, I'm a, and I was a field training officer many years ago, I would receive a dollar an hour while I'm actually working with that person. 
How's that been handled before? That we never have had that. It, when I was a field training officer, it was a handshake, and you got a ex, you got an hour of overtime every paycheck. Got an attaboy. Yes. Um, the last eight ten years, there hasn't been anything. I know other agencies do it throughout the the state and throughout the nation. Nine one one does it already. Currently, there's an incentive for for their training program, for the actual trainers who want to put something in writing. Well, I think it's along the same lines of, of, you've got a vested interest in making sure that that person succeeds. I mean, correct. it's along the same lines. How, how long does the typical training process last for employee? On the roadside, it's a six month field training program. In the jail, it is three months. How many hours are you talking, you think? Maybe a thousand Maybe hours. Or, I, I can't remember how many many daily observation reports they have to do somewhere around 90. So, and, and it's broke up in, a, in a, our field, our training process. You start with one officer, you're with them for two months and you go to another training officer, you're with them for two. And then the third phase, you're with the, oh, the third training officer for two months. Then you have to come back to the first person and you have to do everything on your own and they just shadow you for two weeks. And in the jail, it's a month with one, a month with another, and a month with the third. That's yeah. your permission. No difference in the business assignment by lieutenant training officers. They get counseled. Only worry. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yep. Kind of like training day with Denzel Washington. Though. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> it does take a while. It does. It's, it does. You know, and, there, and there's a lot of time where you know, when I come in at seven in the morning, the night shift, the, the field training officer and his trainee are still there because they're debriefing about what happened and they're doing, they're going over what they're called DORs, daily observation reports. They're still working on those at seven o'clock in the morning and they're supposed to get off at seven. I mean, there's, there's a lot of time invested in being a trainee. It seems officer. to me that they would be doing a lot more than just an hour. Just one hour, like you just said, they're doing, they're still doing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're doing things the whole shift. Yeah. Bring up the data for a motion to read. Yes. Thank you. If, if this isn't done, is it just done on a voluntary basis? In other words, the guys have to volunteer, or do you, is this something you just say, hey, this is what you're going to do to your officers? We take volunteers for the field training program. We training officers. <coughs> we, we can assign anybody to it. Right. But I'm, I don't want to assign somebody that doesn't want to do it because right. Quality of what you're going to get. How many? Uh, how much? Uh, how many are volunteers versus being assigned? They're all volunteered. Okay. We haven't had to assign anybody. You got some guys with some good attitudes then. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they've been for the last, like I said, the last rotated as far as people who's who's done it over the years. Like I said, I was a I was a field training officer for many years. Um, They've trained a lot of people and they haven't, haven't been compensated for it in years. So I think it's time that they receive some type of compensation. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Sheriff. A common county food pantry update for Treasurer Kim Ashcraft and Executive Director Chris. Thank you. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. I'm Chris Ash, President Executive Director of the Ross Common County Food Pantry. Um, Thank you for asking us to be here today and to speak to you again. Last time we were here was December 2022. A lot has changed. A lot has changed with this board. 
a lot has changed with the pantry. Um, what I had spoke to back then was our numbers had been on a steady rise and we were given a dashboard that shows the numbers. What I'd like for you to look at, just to make it easy, <laughs> is the month of April. 2021, I believe it was 185 families that visited the pantry. And then every April, year after year after year, you could see where the numbers went up. I've actually passed out all of the pamphlets to you, so I don't have it in front of me. But I can tell you last month, we did 583 families. Um, somewhat alarming, to say the least. There's a multitude of reasons. Um, people have gotten to know us. People have gotten to trust us. And uh, we have done everything that we can to let people know that we're there and we're here for one reason, and that is to support our community. Still one of our biggest problems is securing food from our distributor, the Food Bank of Eastern Michigan. They are a huge organization. They are part of Feeding America. Most people are part of Feeding America and they are a part of that. They provide food to approximately 67 pantries. So it's not like we're the only one in town. They're supplying to a lot of different agencies we're past the pandemic, but yet they still feel it, we still feel it, and we are struggling to get all of the food that we want. We're getting food, but we're not getting the, the variety of food that was available four or five years ago. Our numbers from 2021 to 2022 increased 33%. Last year, it increased 29%. Um, you can see the numbers month to month, year to year. And basically, they have risen for three consecutive years. I sat here in 22 and said, you never even phantomed that we would be passing out food to 500 families. But we've been passing out food to over 500 families now for almost 10 months and we'll go over 600 families. 70% of the people who come to our pantry are working seniors, and then the worst of the bunch, the fixed income seniors. They have nothing more coming their way. And every time our social security goes up, um, somehow it just pulled from us from side to side where you know, we, we hear about this big increase, but then we look at our social security checks and uh, I don't see a big increase. You know, money's being pulled for medical or, or other things. So I'm concerned about our, our seniors. Uh, the other one is our proud veterans. Um, slowly, I've gotten more and more veterans to come in to seek support. Uh, worst thing we can say to anyone is we're here to help you because nobody wants help. Um, help is a pity word and that's the last thing people want to hear. So we're here to support our community um, regardless of age, regardless of family size. Good morning. I'm Kim Ashcraft. I am uh, the treasurer and grant uh, writer for the, the Ross County County Food Pantry. Um, in my day job, I work for MidMichigan Community Health Services as well. Um, so um, absolutely, um, you know, we, we look at our health and the health out outcomes of our community and uh, receiving food is, is a huge benefit to our community. I'm the numbers girl. So when we look at our county, um, you know, we have roughly 23,884 
uh, community members within our county. Um, I do the needs assessment for our health center, so I'm um, pretty up with uh, the recent data regarding our county and food insecurity. We're um, sitting at 18% food insecure um, with our community. Doing the math, you know, that's around 400, or I'm sorry, 4,299 individuals who are food insecure within our county. Um, when I look at Chris's numbers and, and he talks about how many unduplicated families we have, it's approximately 2,000. <coughs> so if you calculate that out, it's roughly two and a half people per household. You're looking at around 5,000 people who are considered to be food insecure. Um, we are meeting you know, that part of it, but we look at other data than two. Our community has a high ALICE population that asset limited income constrained and employed people, those people who are working and doing all that they can to make ends meet, but still aren't doing it. 47% of our community members fall within ALICE or below poverty level. So when I take that into account, we haven't even touched the iceberg of the potential of people that could be coming into the pantry. Um, according to Chris um, and, and the numbers that he's keeping, we're scaling up around 50 or so new families a month. At that pace, we're going to have a difficult time um, remaining financially secure. Although we're doing the best that we can with all of that, um, keeping up with grants, and uh, gracious donors, I mean, absolutely, we are blessed with our community. People step up and, and are just amazing. Um, but sometimes that keeps me up at night, right? You know, how do we continue to support our, our community members who, you know, when, when Chris talks to people and I talk to people, you know, in the mobile distribution, they've done nothing wrong. They're just trying to live. They're trying to work and make ends meet and everything's going up and, and those needs are continuing to rise. Um, I'm proud of uh, what Chris has accomplished as far as maintaining within our budget. Um, it, as a whole, our pantry, nobody gets paid. It's all volunteer run so that all of our money goes back into operations. Currently, we're sitting at spending around 80% of our um, uh, budget on food. So that goes directly into food. And then that other 20% uh, percent rests within our operating costs, keeping our doors open, the refrigerators going and, and everything else that goes along with that. Um, we look at uh, how much food we've been able to distribute. It's amazing. That little pantry, I welcome any of you to come for, for a tour at any time. We have an open door policy and, and we love to show what we have there, but you'll see a ceiling that's packed full of food, boxes, uh, waiting, you know, for people um, to, to get it out the door. If we took this room and cut it in half, the square footage of the pantry would fit inside this room. So last year we uh, passed out or distributed between both the uh, mobile food distribution and uh, people coming into the pantry, roughly 550,000 pounds of food, 273 tons of food. That equals to approximately 190,000 meals going out to our individuals within our community. Um, that being said, we can't do it with huge partners. We have Walmart, we have Family Fair, Save a Lot, um, Butcher Steve, Ebels is is uh, recently come on and working extremely well with us and in, in providing meat for our families. Um, there are businesses and agencies, countless people who step in and help, and we are just so gracious for everything that our community does to allow us to be the hands and feet of, of the community and uh, making sure that a basic need like food is being met. Our three major needs moving forward is obviously staying financially sound. Um, Kim touched on private donations. Majority of our private donations, I've never met these people. I've met some, I've had some ask for a meet and greet. Um, I can see why someone would say, I would like to see what you do before I back you. Most people don't. I mean, we've had some wonderful people just step up out of nowhere. And usually you think, well, you know, I've met this person or, or they heard about me or whatever, but um, 
great community. I mean, we're very rural, and I think this community fights for each other instead of against each other. So that helps. So staying financially sound, obviously, is a major, you know, point for us. We're still concerned with the Food Bank of Eastern Michigan. Five years ago, we got 95% of our food from the Food Bank of Eastern Michigan. Today, we get 40% of our food from them. That 40% is a lot of food. It's tons and tons of food. But in order to literally give the families in this community um, breakfast, lunch, dinner for three, four days of um, eating, we have to go to Evil's. We have to go to Sam's Club. We have to spend money that I would rather spend on USDA products that are pennies on a dollar instead of paying three sixty nine dollars a pound for hamburger at Evil's. But I'm committed to every family getting a pound of burger if they walk through our door. Two pounds if the family's even bigger. Our last major concern is we are in a very small, tight space. I don't want to say we're stuck there, but in a way we kind of are. But thanks to Dave Rebschleiger, the um, landlord of Pinky's Plaza, um, we pay $1,500 a year in rent. Yeah. If I went to like Family Fair to all them empty buildings over there, they probably went $1,500 a month. And I'm not going to spend money on rent that I don't have Plus, take that money away from food that I would rather pass out. So that is our major concerns moving forward. We are plugging along. We're doing well. I'm confident that this is not going to end anytime soon. Um, as long as I'm sitting in this chair, we'll do everything I can to uh, continue this pantry in the direction that it's going. Thank you. Any questions? I do, of course. <laughs> Eric. <laughs> there we go. Uh, you know, I find these numbers very, very hard to believe. Uh, you know, according to our Democratic friends in Washington and the state of Michigan, uh, we're in the best economy we've ever been in. And here we have these kind of numbers coming down. And, and we're still in the top three in the state. Yeah. Yeah, we, and we've been in the top three in the state. And I, I believe rural has a lot to do with it. I don't want to sit here and talk about housing and jobs, but that affects us too. Um, I, I believe these numbers. You, of course, if my first comment was not correct. I, I oh, believe I, these numbers. I, I think we've got a lot of- lot I, I can send you graphs of day-to-day -day numbers. I mean, everything is Excelled out. Yeah. Um, it has to be, we went digital two years ago for the Food Bank of Eastern Michigan. That's how we know that we're just short of 2000 unduplicated families since April Fool's Day two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it was the biggest joke ever. We spent months beating our heads against the wall, registering new people. But now that we're two years in, we keep books where, unfortunately, people can only come to the pantry once a month. You guys are doing a great job. It's but <coughs> all the outside food trucks, um, ours, the one here in Ross Common, um, thanks to the Sheriff's Department, their head, we do two food trucks here at the Sheriff's Department um, and connection to Linda Hogeboom, who used to be um, one of their victim services unit people. But um, I think Vincent has reached out to me and I've, I've shown them how to run outside food trucks. And I think they're up to five this year. So during the summer months, our residents can go to three food trucks and still visit us once a month, still visit St. Vincent's. Um, John Sutter and St. Helen, you know, he has grass rooted his little pantry over there to uh, help out the community. So there's a lot of support there, but there's a lot of people there. A lot of people who are still too proud to walk in our door. I, I, we do everything to make them as comfortable as we can. And sometimes we have to give them a tissue, but even if people have food stamps and so forth, they can still come in? The only requirement is you be a resident of Ross Common County. Okay. Um, you no longer have to be on food stamps. You no longer have to be unemployed. 
you no longer have to be displaced, which is a very gentle way of saying homeless. I've got a binder that's just full of homeless names. Good report. Yes. You guys really make a difference. We'll see you at church on Sunday. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you for what Thank you, you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Anything else we can do? I didn't come here asking for a donation. December of 22, this panel gave us a donation of $5,000. It's five semi trucks of food that you bought for the Food Pantry of East Mission or from them for us. And that was the last time it was in 1922? I mean, 2022. <laughs> yeah. So long ago. So uh, long ago. <laughs> Eric, if you can get the word out, if you know someone who is looking for a a true Bible 1C3 nonprofit that puts every penny that comes into us back out the proper way, um, I'm one of the few pantries that there's no payroll. I don't get paid for all what volunteers. I do. We're all volunteers, including myself. Um, I worked hard my whole life. I have my social security. I have a wife who has a full-time job. I couldn't do this without her. So, Do you ever see people taking advantage of this that you know shouldn't be? It's minor. Is it? Okay. Mark's getting food. Dave's like, he's getting food, I'm getting food. Um, it's minor. But some okay. people come in to get food and give it to other people. So really okay. it's not our place to judge. Sure. Yeah. You know, when I, I tell I tell volunteers they, they got five seconds to judge, then we're gonna move on to the next family. Um because it's good to say yeah, there, I don't see any way you could police that anyway. So yeah. I, was, I just was wondering if you know, your individual observations that you've been you know the old saying the longer someone talks, the dumber they can sometimes sound. <laughs> We have people come in who say, oh, my God, we, we haven't had food in a month. And they keep talking and talking. And it's like, you know, but it's it's good. It's all good because 99% of the people come in our door, they have a story. We don't ask them for their story. They want to give it to us. We have a, we have a Kleenex box for them. Every volunteer who works there has a story. I was a workaholic my whole life. I had a couple of instances where I was hungry. So, I recommend you if you have a chance to go down a tour. It's it's a it's time Mark has been to the pantry several times. Mark is a donor. Um, he is a good friend. Um, controller Jody was there a couple of years ago. Um, I go back. You know, you're a busy person. The, the box of Kleenex comes in <laughs> handy sometimes. <laughs> but it's all good. Um, Thank we you. we yeah. live in an amazing community. We do. And we, we get a lot of support and we're grateful for it. Thank you for your time. We appreciate Thanks. it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Kim. Veterans Recognition Day, Commissioner Melbourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're going to have a Roscommon County Re Veterans Remembrance Day ceremony, which is the 80th anniversary of D-Day on June 6th. Uh, I'm kind of the MC guy, but the Pledge of Allegiance will be led, will be led by Darlene and Jody. I'll make sure Jody just heard that. Invocation will be Kevin Harbin. Guest speaker will be Bruce Bentley. We're going to present our flag to Sergeant John DeWitt from the Marine Corps. BFW Post 4034 will provide rifle salute. Taps will be by Phil Baker, band director. Bagpiper will be Louis Areola, Mason, Brother Mason, Brother Ma Master Mason. In addition, will be Brian Thompson. I'll give the closing remarks. And I do ask that the Roscommon County Maintenance help us set up, Sheriff for Security, Parky Fire Department for Dave, and IT for the program. We're going to put it together. It's about two and a half weeks from now. That's all I got, Madam Chair. Any questions? Yep. Okay. That's what we... Okay. With that being said, we will adjourn, and our next meeting is at ten o'clock.
meeting to order for the Rust County County Board of Commissioners for May 22nd, 2024 at 10.04 a.m. Commissioner Melbourne. United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Ostergren. Here. Milburn. Here. Wolfson. Here. Spencer. Here. So. Here. Before we do the approval of the agenda, we need to add motion three, the sheriff cadet position. Move with the addition, Madam Chair. Second. Discussion? Roll call, please. Wilson. Yes. Ostergren. Yes. Spencer. Yes. Russo. Yes. Milburn. Yes. Motion carried. Approval of the consent agenda. The items within the consent agenda are the meeting minutes from May 8th, 2024, regular board meeting, and minutes from May 8th, 2024, the Lake Level Control Structure meeting. Correspondences, um, the MSU Extension, Rust Common County 2023 Annual Report, and MAC Legislative Update. Monthly Department Reports was the Sheriff's Report for April and our Administrator Controller Report. Do I have a motion? I'll make that motion. Second. Uh, roll call, please. Melbourne. Yes. Ostergren. Yes. Spencer. Yes. Wilson. Yes. Russo. Yes. Motion carried. Public comment. Is there any public comment? Anything on Zoom? Okay. Any visitors? Unfinished business. Emergency management millage proposals. Director Vanessa Varner. on the statewide exercise meeting right now. I apologize, guys. And that. So I, Vanessa Varner, Emergency Management Director. I put a handout out on everybody's tables during between meetings. Uh, what I did is I put some keynotes as to what has been going on with emergency management since the position was made full time, uh, which was January of 2022. Uh, it was a goal of my predecessor, Michael Beatty, uh, something uh, he worked very hard to do, uh, something that he did during the COVID years. Uh, without hesitation, I guess I <coughs> really say. Uh, conversation recently came up about uh, the, the shortfalls in funding with emergency management coming from the state. And on the back side of the paper that I handed you is uh, some talking points that I received from the state of Michigan regarding EMPG funding, because what's happened is FEMA cut the Emergency management performance grants funding by 10% in the allocations that the state of Michigan is receiving. What that translates to Ross Common County is potentially somewhere in the neighborhood of a 70% cut to what you guys receive for the wages and benefits uh, match for my salary. That's huge because when this position was made full time, it was a 50% match. Okay. That's gonna go down, that's gonna be about 6% of my wages and fringes. Okay. So that creates a huge deficit in an already very tight budget that I have of $116,000. I just want to bring this to your attention because I try really hard to make things happen with little <laughs> to nothing. And I try to be very active within our community. Uh, I build relationships on the Blue Sky Days. I try to attend every meeting I possibly can. Uh, I don't want to 
sit here and read through every bullet point that I gave you. I gave you those bullet points because I think that they're important things for you to look at later. Um, but it came to my attention that we need to start looking for other options in reviewing other things. Uh, so I just, I want you to understand the dire situation that emergency management's in. And I don't want you to think that, I, that I'm ignoring it. Uh, I'm trying to figure out what to do. Uh, and Mr. Ostergren has, and um, Mr. Melvin sat in my <laughs> local emergency planning team meeting and discussed um, some alternate options. Um, he's presented it in multiple uh, meetings previously, um, the idea of looking at the possibility of a millage. I don't know what that looks like, but I want you all to see what the numbers are and where I'm at, okay? Um, and if there's something that you need from me, I'm an open door 24 seven. My phones are always on me. If there's anything I can do for you. Madam Chair, yes. Madam Chair yes. I'm address the chair. Right, that's right. Yeah. Um, Madam Chair, I'd like, I'd like to mention that we have talked about this in previous meetings and we're looking at a 0 0.1 mil uh, as an ask. Right now, uh, emergency management is being paid for out of our general fund. And um, I know uh, that Jody was going to be working up some some uh, language, I believe, for us to prove to be on the uh, ballot for a 0.1 mil increase in November, since it's uh, past uh, past due for this coming uh, election in August. So hopefully, we can move forward with a one mil ask. Uh, as a government, our main responsibilities are the protection of its citizens be it police from foreign or domestic, be it police and emergency planning is a significant part of that. And I think it's important that we do that as a county so we can be prepared in the case of something catastrophic happening. If something catastrophic happens, everything breaks loose and there's not gonna be any perfect solution and there, all the, Situations aren't going to be resolved, but there'll be something in place where we can have somewhere to go or have a, you know, some some fixed plans in place so we can move forward. So I think a 0.1 mil increase, uh, when that's explained to the public, is not going to be that big of an issue. We got a 0.25 mil increase on the Gypsy Month, Bungie Month, to be politically correct. Uh, Increase so I, I think such a small ask and taking it out of the general budget will give them control over that specific area so we won't have to argue back and forth on, on when it comes down to uh, budgetary uh, our budgetary talks that are going to be coming up it'll be a lot easier uh, for emergency planning to have a fixed amount that they know they can rely on every year is that right Vanessa I mean that's Yes. I Is there mean, anything you'd like to add to that? I. I know you, and I know we also we're also talking about combining your position with something with animal control, or was what was the other position that? Nine one one, maybe. That, uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I know that there was something else that there was a possibility of Vanessa working on also at the same time. Is that, or am I talking out of? Somewhere I should be talking. <laughs> out of school, Larry. Well, <laughs> keep in mind. If there may be a conversation that was had that I'm not aware of. Thank you for sharing your conversation with yourself. <laughs> okay. I'm just throwing things out there, seeing what sticks, you know. I, so. I've offered to assist with materials management if that is available or if that's needed, but that's, that's okay. the other thing that I'm aware of, so. Well, hopefully we can get that on, and we don't wait till the last minute as a commission to get this on the ballot this coming November. And I know uh, after this meeting, uh, Sheriff Stern and I and Jody are gonna be talking about, you know, splitting out public safety and, and uh, seeing what the sheriff's position is on that. 
uh, is going to be very important. And uh, what his opinion on it is going to directly influence uh, what I feel, how I feel about moving forward with that also. Anybody else? Yes. I'll chime in. As a Marine officer, I was involved in emergency management. It's very important. Nobody realizes how important it is until you need it. You got my support. One, one mil is good. I see what you do. Yeah, I no, one one mil. Yeah. I see what you do. One mil. A tenth of one mil. You sure blew me away. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vanessa. Michigan Other Great Lakes Trademarking Update. Commissioner Milburn. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have an economic development meeting tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. I'm going to propose to the Economic Development Board that they pay for the funding that's proposed right now at 1500 That's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam, yes. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. at the start of this, it was requested that the Chamber of Commerce, which apparently is using that trademark, and perhaps a village be contacted about this proposal. Has that been done yet? I, I can address that. Yes. I should have brought all my pamphlets in. I, I have multiple pamphlets to say Michigan's other Great Lakes is used by all three chambers, Lake St. Helen, East Lake, and Holden Lake. I mean, I got voluminous, amount, voluminous, voluminous amounts of literature that say that. So nobody's, with, with the word you used last time, stealing, nobody's stealing anything from anybody. But the request was that contact be made with these people. Sorry? The request was that contact be made with these people. I don't understand. He, he, he said the request was that contact be made with these people. And I think you just said that's what you did. The Economic Development Corporation is going to vote on it tomorrow. If they're, if they're going to supply the funding. If they supply the funding, I'll bring it back to the, but, to the board for... He wants them to do it for all three teams. So economic development is going to contact all. Okay, that's what I'm asking. Any other questions? I just want to say uh, I support this 100%. I think it's important. It's not going to cost that much, and I and I believe we're even looking into you know having not even having the county pay for it if we can get some volunteers who uh, come up with the money. That'll be uh, even better. Well, my intent, Madam Chair, is to have the economic development board pay for it out of their funding. Okay. I, I got to push it through tomorrow. It's going to be, it's going to be a tough sell. Bottom line is it's important that, 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 that they pay for it and then we bring it forward to the commissioners. Okay. In respect to, to Rex's comments last time, you know, the thing is we don't have the money, so it's economic development should, should have some skin in the game. My only concern is that people that are using that now be well aware of what's happening. Okay. And, you know, yeah, if they're on board with it, that's good because then they they can utilize the trademark through us for a dollar or whatever. But since they are using it, then they need to be contacted and ask their opinion of it. Okay, thanks, Rex. I'll, I'll do that. Good point, Rex. Any other discussion on that? Materials Management Planning County Update, Vice Chair Rex Wilson. Oh, I'm sorry. Higgins Lake per permit update. Delegated authority, Chase Shutkey. Sorry about that, Chase. Skip I skipped you. I'm sorry. I thought I was going to dodge a bullet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we sent um, Chase Shutkey. We sent a permit into Eagle for Higgins Lake, and we got it back with a list of things they want. Um, you gotta watch how I say this in case they're watching. Um. <laughs> I don't that, that's for the permit to get it temporary fixed for this summer, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. I I don't know what you guys want me to do, but I would talk. I would like to talk to an attorney to see what we're actually required to give them. Um, some of the things they're asking for are cross sections of stop log bay, for just adding additional stop logs, cross sections of the plates for just adding an extension on top of the plate. In my mind, those are almost maintenance things and maintenance should not even require to be permitted. They're all above the ordinary high mark. 
and to go through and do all this stuff how they want it, it could be a lot of time and work that I don't know if they have the authority to even ask for. Um, there are some things that they do as soon as you get below the water level, and that's essentially in the opening. But all the, a lot of the other stuff, I think you don't even need a permit for it. It was more of a kind of, this is what we're going to do. It was more of a courtesy. Um, I was just bringing this to your guys' attention and how you want me to play it. What do we need to do? Just give you permission to go about well, it the way I, you what think I would should? Like, I would like to consult. I mean, we. I'm assuming we have Spicer Group on, even though we're not using them currently for Higgins Lake, correct, Jody? A phone call, conversation with them, and then I don't know if it needs to go beyond that. He might say, no, you don't have to do this, this, and this. Those aren't required to be permitted and leave it at that. But I mean, if in my opinion, if you go to the Eagle and say, hey, what do I have to permit? They're going to say everything. Even if what kind of time frame do we have on getting this back to them? Uh, that's a good question. I want to say like a month usually. So it's pretty important that we do this like right away then because you, you're under some time constraints. To get I would like to do it right away so I don't think about it. I'm sure. Yes. Can I address it? Yes. Um, Part of this permit was putting stones back in the stream bed. Is that's that correct? That's where we're going to have to. That's where we have to comply. And, and I understand that when we yeah, need the, permits for it. Yeah, but as far as working on the gates, as long as you're not affecting the structural integrity of the structure, which you are not. Yeah, that's where I'm going. Courtesy, Even like to put stones in the stream bed, we're not affecting. We don't need engineering stats on the correct, structure. We are, they're not asking for engineering. They're just asking for everything but. Basically, that's what they're asking. Yeah. So, but I mean, at that point, you're below the high water mark. So that's where that gets tricky. But everything above so, the high so water. So separating mark is, out and having a separate permit for that issue is to no advantage, probably to us. I what I would do is talk to someone, say you don't need a permit. I just remove it and just be permit be about the rocks and just do the rest. That's what I was one getting yeah, at. That, I Cause, mean, Cause just putting, bringing the stream bed back up to its level it should be, doesn't affect the structure at all, really. It, does, it doesn't, yeah, I don't, I, again, it, it should be as easy as, it should. It should be easy, but the state is it, not gonna I, I would think that would just be, that would be maintenance. Because if the, if you see a washout, you just throw some gravel. Yeah, you gotta do something with it. Yeah. So, but I would like to talk, I'm just telling you guys where my head is, where the permit is. I would like to have permission to talk to someone. And Well, I think if we had a legal opinion, whether or not we need a permit for the other things. Yeah, I'd, I'd like legal to see. Legal opinion is no, we move forward. Yeah, I'd like to see what we have to opinion. do because each, each little thing they want, details, cross sections, all yeah. this stuff adds X amount of hours onto it. Mm -hmm. So whatever you can cut off. Just saves time and saves time in the long run. My thinking is legal opinion says you don't need a permit on some things. We don't need a permit on them, and then and just go pull out that. what we do need a permit for and reapply a permit for those things that we do need a permit. For. That would be my suggestion. I would have to agree with Rex. If you need to do a legal opinion for what to make. What you feel comfortable i'm okay with that and then move forward yeah. from there again i gave them everything as a courtesy yeah. most of the stuff like in the past it was like oh okay not a big deal but thank you for letting me know mm -hmm. so yes i'm sure i'd agree with both of you and, and that I, I i would move that we allow chase he is the expert mm -hmm. he knows what's going on we we, we can't micromanage him yeah. we should let him move ahead with what he thinks is the best way to move forward with eagle I, 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 just, I just don't know how aggressive you guys want to be well, we're in <laughs> we're in a jam this summer. We're uh, going to be below legal level today. You know, I looked at the numbers, and they're exactly what you said they were earlier. And that's because we had a heavy duty rain. It's going to be uh, in, a, in a lot of wind blowing from the northwest, and uh, we're going to have some problems this summer. Yes, you've been appointed by this board to be the delegated authority. I will not stand in the shadows and throw darts and, and have secret meetings. You do what you think is best needed. And if, well, you need, I, I, if you need to come to the board and ask for some permission, do so, and we'll be, we'll be happy to. I, 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 I want I want permission before I poke eagle. I understand. 
Yeah. So she, she'd be here today. Madam Chair. Yes. I think we need to ask the board for a general consensus on this then for delegated authority. I think the general consensus yeah. is so that he has okay. has the right to do it. Do we want to put that on the record or not? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. All right, I'll make it happen. Thanks. See you guys. Thanks. Now we're at materials management. Okay, materials management update. Um, I've sent a letter out to the surrounding counties asking if they wanna participate in this program as a Mola County thing. Other than Crawford County, which had asked us earlier and I did not respond to that, nor have I sent them a letter asking them to join us because this board has to make a decision whether or not we want to enter into a multi-county program. Yes, Mark. Yes. I will only, only, I will only enter to a multi uh, agreement with another county if it's in our benefit. It's gotta be in our benefit. I don't want to be the, the second string player as I've seen agreements since I've been doing this for 20 years, where some where you you jump into an agreement, we're, we're the, kind of the second sister, so to speak. Well, comment on that. Um, we've been in contact with the townships on this, and I think so far we have Bacchus Township, Richfield, Lyon, and Sabo, Higgins, and Nestor, maybe. In, in Nestor, yeah. Yeah. So all those townships want Garish. us. Marking. They've responded to us, but yeah. so you know, all the townships want us to do this instead of having the state put it on us. But I'm also hearing from the townships at, attending their meetings and stuff, they do not want to lose local control over it. And their concern with going multi county is we may lose some local control. But that's what I was referring to, Rex. The bottom line is, I appreciate your leadership on this task force. I'm going to probably go with your recommendation, but I want to make sure that we maintain local control. Well, I just, you know, today we're just seeking general consensus of the board that, yes, we stay just one county and proceed with it. Where I say right now, I'd like to say just with our county. Unless I can be swayed by Eric. By Eric. I bow to your expertise on this yeah. one, Rex. <laughs> An expert on anything. You've done the work in the bottom line. Other than the team yeah, you've done the work. <laughs> okay. Madam Chair. The micromanager. All right. I'll continue forth with that information and we'll move forward then. Thanks. Thank you. Electronic scanning and meeting minutes update. Our clerk, Michelle Stevenson. Good morning. Um, I'll just read this real quick. For everybody. Um, honorable Commissioners, on March 27, 2024, I presented you with two proposals for the scanning of all Board of Supervisor and Board of Commissioner meeting minutes beginning in 19 or 1875 to present date. At that meeting, I provided you with quotes from U.S. Imaging and Co-File. Following that meeting, I continued to do some research, hence the delay in my asking for the Board's approval on the project. I had further discussions with the vendors from the two proposals I had presented to you, and during those discussions, thought to reach out to my current vendor, GovOS, to see if we could add the minutes to the current search application we, we utilize with them. If so, what would, that, what would that cost? I also spoke with U.S. Imaging about some of the items on the quote provided and was able to reduce the cost slightly. One thing to keep in mind is that U.S. Imaging usually comes in under the quoted price, at least that has been my experience with them on the other projects we have done with them. They also scan our books on site, so there's no reason for the minute books to leave the building. The initial scanning project will be a one-time cost of approximately $8,562. He sent me a revised quote yesterday right at the end of the day, so I had already printed this out and I wasn't going to print it for a third time, um, <laughs> which should be able to cover um, be covered utilizing funds from the general fund clerk ROD 2024 budget. In addition to the scanning project cost, there will be a one-time fee of $2,300 to GovOS, who is my current vendor that we utilize now for search options, um, to GovOS to convert and upload the images to the Vanguard cloud search program. There will then be an annual cost of $2,940 to host this option on our current search program. 
I have attached the proposal from U.S. Imaging for the scanning of the Ross Common County Minutes books from 1875 to 2024 and the proposal from GovOS for adding the minutes to our current search application with OCR capability. I'm seeking to support to place this project as a motion on the agenda for June 12, 2024. So um, as I mentioned, GovOS is my current vendor. And so we utilize them now for documents. So ROD documents are registered of deeds documents. And we have index searchability for marriage licenses and DBAs and other um, documents in the clerk's office that the index, whatever is available for the public that's made available on that site that they can search it. And so I, I had asked them, I was like, um, hey, can we add this? And they were like, absolutely. So they showed me a county in Texas. And um, basically what they can do is individuals can search the minutes and then OCR, for those who aren't familiar with that, they can type in words and then the computer algorithms. So look for through all of the minutes that are available and they can find all of the minutes that have those words, those keywords in there. So that would um, make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, I know I was asked, do I charge for searching? I do not charge for searching. Um, that was just something that I have chosen not to do uh, with regard to register of deeds records. There are counties who do charge for just for searching the records period. And then it's a dollar per copy. Um, I haven't done that in the past. I don't feel that I in the past, I haven't needed to. I've always made enough with copy revenue and such to cover um, the expenditures, plus with the automation fund that I have in the CPL fund, those are specific funds. And the automation fund is for technology and making things accessible for register on the register of deeds side. So that's where a bulk of that program is paid for. Um, I would have to fund some out of the general fund um, with it being for the minutes but then the bulk of it is covered between my CPL fund and my automation fund. Are there any questions? Madam Chair? Yes. Can I address it? Yes. Um, if someone did a FOIA request, the system would handle that? They could do it through that system? Is that correct? Well, if they this is where it would be helpful for us is if they submit a FOIA request and we let them know that those documents are available online to the public, at no cost. I mean, they still have to pay for the copies, but um, they but they still want us to do it. We can charge them double. So that would save. Uh... <laughs> what is double? Double what? What is the cost of a FOIA request? It's per copy. It's yeah. It depends. Time. Yeah, it could be inclusive of. The lowest weight of the person who is able to procure the document, um, cost of the lowest cost of the rate for the person that is able to review to make sure nothing needs to be redacted, cost of copying, um, time it takes to copy, so all of those things can be included in there. So this program in theory would cut down on FOIA request, is that correct? It may not cut down on the FOIA request, but we can make them aware that that information is available. And currently we do put the minutes on the county website and they're tagged to the minutes or to the meeting recordings. And if we actually just have them available in the search platform, we don't have to take up space on the website. We don't have to worry about uploading that because um, I don't really know how long they're maintained on the website attached to the meetings. I don't know if that's an indefinite thing or not. That's a. I was, just, I was just wondering if there shouldn't be some user fees attached to this. Well, if they want to print anything, I can have it set up and it, the, it'd be a dollar page. So. Yes, if you do the printing, if they look it up and do it, then there's no charge, right? Well, if they print anything off of the Register of Deeds site, it's a dollar page. So mm -hmm. I can assess, a, I can attach a fee to it. Right, but I'm talking like to say a FOIA request, somebody wants to request some information. On it's some 10 documents. cents a page. FOIA request is 10 cents a page. Right. And are these going to cover, is this going to cover just the minutes? In other words, the availability to look things up according to the minutes? Or say, for example, somebody called in and wanted a request for some documents pertaining to a certain subject. 
how would you go about doing a search on documents for a particular subject? Do you do that now by a scan? Is that how you do it? In my office, if somebody wants anything with the minutes, we go through the minutes index and we've got to sit there and we've got to look through every, we've got to look through the minutes, minutes index. Correct, correct. Yes. But, but, but if they wanted some documents on say, hey, I want to look at everything I'm taking slate for the last 25 years. I'm going to say, uh, you can come on in and I'll pull those folders for you. Okay. Okay, no, no I'm just yeah. being, you know, honest. Yeah. No, 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 yep. I I it's not a scanning. <laughs> You've done that before, haven't you, Joey? Several times for um, so what you're talking about, two separate things. Mm -hmm. She's simply talking about the scanning of the minutes. But what I will tell you is the first place that I would go to, to make sure that I'm covering any and all topics that go back to the 1800s. Um, if somebody says they want every and all documentation related to Higgins Lake, Holton Lake, Lake St. Helen, because we've had one for each of those, mm -hmm. is getting them to search the minutes and make copies of the minutes. So then I have an idea where to start looking. Um, other than that, I, it's literally going drawer by drawer by drawer by physical well, If they weren't documents. covered in the minutes, then those documents could be out there somewhere and nobody would even know about it. And not by now. Right. Not by now. Not by the number of times that I have looked by documents. They, they'd be newer ones that nobody's provided to the county yet for some reason. So. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Got a little story on for you. Okay. A few years ago, a person came in and demanded FOIA requests at a meeting. The kicker was is that most of the stuff from FOIA is already available online. The person walked out of the meeting within an hour with all the documents. Most of the stuff that you need is already trackable. So most people, when they ask FOIA, most of the time they, because you they just ask the clerk nicely, or ask the chair or ask Judy, we'll get all the documents right off the same day, most of the time. And I have to add to that, okay, as adversarial as I've been sometimes. Most of the time. With, yeah, with, yeah, well, as adversarial as I've been sometimes with the board and, and FOIA requests and so forth, both Michelle and Jody have been great on getting that information. So I have never had a complaint with FOIA requests. Okay. Well, we will put this on then and at our next meeting. New business. We have none. Number 10 motions and resolutions. Clerk, whenever you are ready. Motion number one move to authorize the levy of the following ad valorem tax rate for the County of Ross Common for the year 2024 on the summer tax roll. General fund 3.4613 mills. Mm -hmm. Second. Discussion? Yes, uh, this is the same. We're not asking for an increase. We're just, it's just to approve what we already have on board. Okay, make sure. Okay. Roll call, please. Melbourne. Yes. Ostergren. Yes. Spencer. Yes. Russo. Yes. Wolfson. Yes. Motion carried. Motion number two, move to authorize Darlene Censor Chair and Michelle M. Stevenson County Clerk to sign the summer L4029 with the following tax rates for the County of Ross Common for the year 2024. General fund 3.4613 mills. So. Discussion? Roll call? Ostergren? Yes. Censor? Yes. Milburn? Yes. Wolfson? Yes. Russo? Yes. Motion carried. Motion number three, move to authorize the creation of a non-union Roscommon County Deputy Sheriff Cadet position as presented by Sheriff Ed Stern, Ed Stern at an hourly rate of $14.15 to $16.24 per hour, depending on experience. Funding for new positions will be allocated from existing budgeted wages within the Sheriff's Road Patrol Fund. Second. Discussion? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I got to say, 14.15 to 16.24 an hour, anybody that would want to come on board, God bless them, yeah. for that kind of money. The, the risk uh, our officers take out there and, and what they do for, for public safety and so forth is unbelievable. And uh, I, I support this 100%. Any other discussion? 
Roll call. Russo. Yes. Ostergren. Yes. Sensor. Yes. Milburn. Yes. Wolfson. Yes. Nothing carried. Committee reports. Commissioner Asperger. Yeah, we had a, a meeting after our last meeting with uh, Circle Paul about solar energy product in Kings Township uh, with Elise Mays and uh, Jody was there. Uh, Jamie Hauserman uh, could not make it, um, but I think Jody filled her in on a lot of the uh, information. This is a very, very exciting project and I'm very excited that, that we're moving forward with this. It could mean a lot of tax revenue uh, to the county and I, and I would ask Jody to explain, so it isn't coming from me, a little bit about what she observed and derived from the meeting about the kind of potential tax revenue they could mean to the county. Go ahead, Jody, please. I'm waiting for that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, you may, if you'd like. <laughs> We're getting all these good. procedures. You know? um, so I don't want to speak, I, I can't be very specific about the tax revenues, um, but I understand a little bit better now of the derivatives of how they can provide um, revenues back into the system. There are two different ways um, and I'll back up. So essentially um, they are already in a position where they have a contract with the state for a, uh, basically they're allowed to look at certain properties and uh, developmental basically, a developmental lease. So they can look at these properties and if they so determine circle power that they are able to be utilized or a solar field, they will then have the option of leasing that. So that portion's already out the door, that's out the gate. They've been in touch with Higgins Township. They have talked to <coughs> Cornelia um, and the current clerk over there. So those things are already happening, which was really great to know. Um, they're looking at two different potential models for how revenues could be, be brought back in, how they're going to pay local taxes, basically. Um, the first, which sounds like it's the model they're doing in the UP already, is just a traditional personal property tax. Um, we discussed what items would or could be included or excluded from personal property tax um, and essentially what they're paying now um, is everything that's not absolutely permanent. So if they can pick it up and move it, even if it's, you know, takes them two and a half hours to unscrew the panel and move it, that's going to be something that they're currently paid for under, um, under what they pay for up in the UP for the project they have up there. Um, this will be the traditional way of paying taxes to, to the area. Um, and obviously that's going to be based on the formula that they utilize and submit through for per personal property tax to the state. Um, any special assessments they have to pay automatically if they're in those districts um, and are currently already doing so. The second method is um, kind of a fancy payment in lieu of taxes. Um, so similar to what the state does for properties they own in counties and townships, where they pay X amount based on, um, but this is actually a set amount, and I believe it was $9,000, seven, $7,000. Seven, $7, um, so they would pay that $7,000 directly to um, for that. So it's a hit or miss. Now, the trick to that is it has to be approved by Higgins Township or whatever township that property is in before doing that. Um, but basically at that point, Higgins Township would be looking at what would their collections be based on A versus B to make that determination. And then it rolls up to the state for approval. Um, so they will pay something. Their project is not eligible for the fancy solar grant funding. Um, because of the way that it's coming in. And that is one of the things that our equalization director had been uh, concerned about is that offset of that. Um, they'd be looking at a permanent fixture of hiring, um, basically like a maintenance landscape crew, um, local crew to do the brush clearing, et cetera. Um, the other portion of it was um, it's not a ton of local jobs, but you'd be looking at three to four local jobs, um, full-time jobs that would be brought into the area for that. Um, it is also overseen and um, all sorts of sensors, cameras, et cetera, for that area. Um, and then we discussed a little bit about fire danger, um, not coyotes. They didn't have an answer for the coyote concern. Um, or lack of coyotes, but um, I, I followed up because they were discussing how the solar panel, the risk of solar panel uh, fire, because obviously you're in a jack pine area. And so I did get a chance to talk to Chief Fisher, who worked as a regional for DNR Fire. 
Um, and he uh, he agreed, yes, solar panels would be much less uh, much less of a concern in that area than the standing jack that would jack pine that would be cleared out. So I definitely think um, I definitely think it has the possibility of being good for our community. Um, I, I, I'd like, Madam Chair, could I add to that? Some of the tax money, so-called tax money payment, is based on kilowatts can be produced by that. That's one way. That's one one part of the component of this. And also, we had question: once they get this up and running, should they sell it? Do these funding things come back to the township guaranteed? And they said yes. So, so if they sell the project the agreement they've worked out with the township follows through the, the new buyers. And I'd like to add, thanks, Madam Chair. I'd like, I'd like to add that uh, this is all in preliminary stages right now. That was made very, very clear to us, but it's moving ahead very, very uh, well. And as a comparison, uh, up in the UP at the solar project that I um, can't remember the name of the whatever it was, but anyway, uh, and Jody can't remember either. So he's, uh, they're looking at $12 million in tax revenue over 10 years. That's a lot of tax revenue. And it would, uh, if it was of similar size, and this looks like it's going to be a similar size, it could be bigger, it could be smaller. But we don't know, like we said, it's all in the preliminary stages. So this would be some pretty good tax revenue for the uh, county and would uh, just about double the uh, property tax revenue for Higgins Township. So I think it's going to be really important for Higgins Township uh, to get behind this also. I think uh, they would appreciate that extra tax revenue, which is about 100 grand a year. Thank you. Anyway, I'm really excited about it, if you can't tell. <laughs> and, I, and, I'm, and even after I leave, I'm gonna, I told Elise and uh, uh, Jody and Rex, uh, I'm going to be willing to, to work with whoever our uh, new uh, commissioner is on uh, moving this project forward. Commissioner Melbourne. COA, Northern Michigan Action Agency. Once again, I got outvoted 29 to zero or 29 to one. I never request, I don't like the fact that they passed the Head Start waiver for the school bus. I feel the school buses should be should have uh, seat belts for children. But I've had a history of always voting against that. Last year was three, I got three votes this year, I got zero. So I'm back down to one, 29 to, 29 to one or thereabouts. That's all I have, thank you. Commissioner Russo. 911 Authority Board. Uh, we have ads out there for a new director and airport meeting. That's it, thank you. Um, I had the agenda meeting last Thursday, multiple phone conversations and email regarding the Houghton Lake Special Assessment District with different residents. And I attended a uh, animal control meeting regarding some building issues at the shelter. Commissioner Wolfson. I also attended the meetings at animal shelter and then I, attended as an alternate to Northern Lakes Mental Health. <clears throat> I don't have a good report on that, I'm sorry. I attended the meeting and I was told I could not have a seat at the table because I was not the person that our county had assigned to go there, even though I was the alternate. And I could sit in the audience and if I had a good memory, I could take stuff back to my board, I was told. I didn't stay for the meeting. <coughs> board comment. Commissioner Astrogan. No, I don't have any comment. Okay. Commissioner Belvin. I stand with the Emory Road people. Uh, I hear their, their little ad in the radio said they talk about bearing lines. I see a news release from March. It says consumers energy approved to bury 10 miles of electronic lines in six commission counties. I feel I feel the consumer's power is not listening to the people. I believe they should take an alternate uh, route. It's based by Mr. Jeffrey Max Lavoy and the Emory Group, Emory, the Emory Road people. That's all I have. Thank you. Commissioner Russo? No. Um, I would also agree with Commissioner Milburn on the Emory Road and Consumers Energy. 
Um, I did reach out to our controller, Jody, to ask to make sure that that resolution that we had passed was forwarded back to them to let them know where we stood on that. And um, I'd like to remind everybody on the 23rd, we have a public hearing at the Holton Lake High School for the SAD apportionments on Houghton Lake. And also on the 28th at 5.30, we're still there at six o'clock, but apparently the meeting's changed to 5.30 now. Richfield Township is having their first public hearing on such matter. And I encourage everybody to attend that can. Thank you. Do we have any public comment? There we go. Uh, good morning, I'm Tim O'Rourke, uh, Garrish Township resident. I just wanted to come and announce, uh, I think you all know that I've uh, thrown my hat in the ring for District 2, uh, County Commission seat. Uh, looking forward to an active election and hopefully I'll be sitting up out there taking questions. Um, I had a couple of comments about some of the stuff that's going on. The Ask My Tax stuff, um, I've read a lot of their documents. Um, I think there's a lot of unintended consequences of passing that. that I don't think they're really taking into consideration. The, the, I understand what they're saying is that they, they want to put an end to taxing property year after year after year, and then having local government, state government rely on that body of taxing uh, on stuff that they've already purchased. They bought a house, they bought a piece of property, they own a business, and then it's consistent taxing year after year after year is the basis to run local government, which it mostly is. Um, the unintended consequences, some of them that I thought about, um, they're going to have to replace that tax money with something else. It could be a local income tax. It could be, you know, think of, think of any way that local government is going to need the money to fund itself. And they're not opposed to any of that. But I think that what they don't understand is that when you switch over to that, that you lose the benefit of some of the, uh, the laws that are in effect that would protect people. Like Headley says you can only raise it, property tax by so much in a year, uh, no matter what the cost of the living goes up, the cost of the property goes up. That, that would not be available to them if it was an income tax or some other tax. The, uh, I think some of the proponents of it are people that have second homes um, and they have to pay the uh, extra 18 bills or whatever it is for that second home. That vanishes because that's not part of the process anymore. So I think some of the people that are pushing that probably are people that own second homes. Some people that own businesses that are trying to get out of paying those taxes, those local property taxes, the big solar farms that come in. You know, you can't, if you can't tax them on the property, the personal property they own, uh, then they you have to find a different way to tax them. Um, Glasses back off. Uh, the food bank. Um, I think that the board, like most of the public, we want to support that effort. Uh, it surprises me at just how many families are in that position. And I think that's one of the general things that uh, this board and the county government and township government should be aware of. I think like anything, if you come to the end of the year and you have a surplus over your budget, that would be a consideration that I think you should take in. You should be making a list of things that you'd like to fund if you had money at the end of the year. So I think that's a, an excellent place for extra money to be spent that I think you'd have the support of the public for sure if you did that at the end of the budget year. The uh, sheriff's proposals, I, I'm pro that. I think you have to find a way to get people into the system um, and to give a, a one-time incentive payment to somebody to help bring in new candidates and then help them stay so that they stay here. I think those are excellent ideas. I'm always in favor of one-time payments versus 
increase in salaries because that's a forever thing that you're doing. Um, in my mind, if you keep salaries at a certain level, but then you replace the missing amount every year that you're able to do in your budget, and it comes back to you to you have the budget. If there's extra money, you pay an incentive or a bonus or whatever it is. We did that over and over again at the road commission. And that keeps salaries maybe a bit lower than surrounding areas, but that bonus check makes up for that because you bring them back to what they would have gotten if you're able to. And if you have a bad year, you don't get the money, you overspend some, some big ticket item comes in that you're required to pay, um, then you, maybe you can't make that incentive payment. But on a normal basis, people are going to get that raised amount every year uh, through the incentive program. So uh, I think that's it. Thank you for listening. Appreciate it. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay. So I just wanted to take a second. Um, as oh, Jody Valentino, Garrett Township resident. <laughs> I just want to take a minute. Um, I know you've all individually met Joe. Um, Julie is exiting the building. She will be retiring on June 6th. Um, Joe Kreinberg is her replacement that was selected. Um, she has been training with Julie for a couple weeks now. She has not left crying at all, not once. Um, so, so far, so good, I think. Um, she is seems to be totally oblivious to the yelling that Noelle and I do from office to office um, and has chimed in on a couple of bars of tunes that we've already put in. Um, so I think she'll stay. She's doing a great job. But I just wanted um, you guys to all have her formally introduced to you. Um, she is currently moving to her family cottage from downstate, but has been in this area since she was knee high to a dock. Um, so Joe will, be, Joe will be the new Julie, she'll be Joe. Um, so she'll be taking over as the administration secretary. Um, patience, kindness um, is much appreciated for her, for all of us. So welcome aboard. Thank you. And then second, most importantly, um, June 6th at 2 o'clock in this room is Julie's retirement party. So. Any other public comment? Yes. Michelle see you in St. County Clerk. Um, so just to be clear, so any ballot wording that if you wish to put anything on for November is due August 13th. And then ballot wording for constitutional amendments and legislative referendums, which the legislature wishes to place on the November general election ballot presented to the Secretary of State is due by Friday, September 6th. They have a little bit of time. Um, just a little quick update to what's going on in my office currently. Uh, every year we do the juror questionnaires. So we're currently getting ready to send out the second notice on those which came in at just under 700 that we have to send out out of 3,000. Um, so we're thankful for the residents that responded in a timely manner. Um, we are still getting phone calls daily on those. Uh, of course, got the first round of ballot proofs on Monday and went through, viewed those, sent them back for corrections, got the second set today. So we will be busy sending out the ballot proofs to all of the candidates and the organizations that submitted ballot proposals for August for them to uh, approve their name on the ballot. They're just verifying the spelling of their name that we that I put it on correctly. And um, I have a meeting with the election commission next Wednesday for us to approve the ballots um, so that once we obtain state approval, we can get them printed. The legislature, of course, has until, uh, I want to say it's June, Friday, June 7th, that until they can decide to put something on the ballot. So I have not heard that the state's going to put anything on the August ballot. So we can't print, we can never print our ballots until after that deadline passes. 
So we try to do everything that we can to have all of our stuff prepared. So then once that deadline passes, we can contact our printers and say, go print because we have to have the ballots for this. Um, we have to have moved ballots to the clerks by June 22nd and the AV ballots have to be available um, 40 days. So by that Tuesday. So it's just a little bit of what's going on in my office. A lot of order, but just for transparency issue, Eric shot me a little letter that says that we that we didn't mention that we went into the big level control. It's kind of one of, the, one of the one of those things that er nobody was in charge, so everybody was in charge, and so nobody was in charge <laughs> of reporting on uh, oh, wait, the late. Eric, Eric gave me a note. I just wanted for transparency issues, people to realize yeah, that wasn't. But that was a normal before. meeting. I know that. I just wanted for people to realize that we weren't doing secret stuff back and forth. Here. Oh, okay. That's not that smart. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. And just a reminder that our lake level control structure meeting next month is at 8.30 on yes. the 12th, June 12th. June 12th, 8.30 for our lake level control structure. Is there anybody on Zoom for public comment? <laughs> no further public comment. All in favor to adjourn, say aye. aye.